Note. The substance of this volume was given in a course of lectures at the London School of Economics in the autumn of 1917. I have to thank my colleague Dr A. Wolfe for reading the manuscript and making several useful emendations of detail. The Metaphysical Theory of the State Lecture 1 The Objects of Social Investigation People naturally begin to think about social questions when they find that there's something going wrong in social life. Just as in the physical body it is the ailment that interests us, while the healthy processes go on without our being aware of them, so a society in which everything is working smoothly and in accordance with the accepted opinion of what is right and proper raises no questions for its own members. We are first conscious of digestion when we are aware of indigestion and we begin to think about law and government when we feel law to be oppressive or see that government is making mistakes. Thus, the starting point of social inquiry is the point at which we are moved by a wrong which we desire to set right or, perhaps at a slightly higher remove, by a lack of which we wish to make good. But from this starting point, reflection advances to a fuller and more general conception of society. If we begin by criticising some particular injustice, we are led on to discuss what justice is. Beginning with some special social disorder, we are forced to examine the nature of social order and the purposes for which society exists. The social theory which we reach on these lines is a theory of ends, values, purposes which leads us up to ethics or moral philosophy, to questions of the rights and duties of man and the means by which institutions of society may be made to conform thereto. The principles of ethics are supreme or, as they have been called, architectonic. They apply to man in all relations and to life on all sides. They guide or are meant to guide the personal life of man no less than his collective and political activities. They provide the standard by which all human relations are to be judged. When, therefore, we study social and political institutions with a view to ascertaining their value or justification, our inquiry is in reality a branch of ethics. Our results rest, in the end, on the application of principles of well-being to the social organisation of man. This is one perfectly legitimate method of social inquiry, and as involving an analysis of common experience, leading up to or down from a theory of ends or values, it is appropriately called social philosophy. Legitimate as it is, this method of investigating society has its special danger. In pursuing the ideal, it sometimes loses hold of the actual. In analysing the meaning of institutions, it may overlook their actual working, and if we follow it too blindly, we may end either in abstract propositions which have little relation to practical possibility and serve only to breed fanatics, or in abandoning the interest in actual society altogether and amusing ourselves with the construction of utopias. In reaction from this tendency, many students would say that the primary business of social theory is to investigate the facts of social life as they are, the historical development of society and its several institutions, the statistical description of any given society as it is, the endeavour to ascertain the laws of cause and effect which, it is held, must permeate social life as they permeate every other sphere of reality. In place of a social philosophy, then, we have a social science, and it is held that by a social science we can ascertain, measure and predict just as we can ascertain, measure and predict the behaviour of any system of physical bodies. Without touching here on the question 
Whether in social science prediction is possible or not, it is sufficient to say that the scientific study of social life or the endeavour to ascertain the relations of cause and effect is not only a legitimate object but one which has in point of fact yielded good results. Few would now deny that the strictly scientific method has its place in social inquiry. But objection may still be taken to the distinction between ideals and facts. To begin with, it may be urged that the social inquirer could not, if he would, lay aside his ideals. Whenever we are dealing with social life, we are dealing with the matter of profound interest to ourselves. When the chemist wishes to ascertain the temperature at which a solid liquefies, or a liquid boils, he has, in the end, to read of a certain observation, and it is not a matter of profound human interest whether the figure that he reads is 150 degrees or 160 degrees. But whether a student inquires how an institution is working, whether a new law is attaining its object, whether trades union activity is or is not succeeding in raising wages, shortening hours, or otherwise improving the conditions of the operatives, the answer to his question is not only in reality much more difficult to ascertain, but it is also one which stirs prejudices, confirms or refutes presuppositions, is certain to be challenged by lively interest. The difficulty is not peculiar to the study of contemporary fact. History, even ancient history, is written in a certain spirit, and a certain temper depended on the personal presuppositions of the writer. Human affairs are so complex and the interweaving of cause and effect so subtle that in the presentation of an historical development there will always be an element dependent on the point of view of the writer and on the selection and emphasis which may honestly seem the fairer selection and the natural emphasis to a particular writer but which may seem quite other to a different investigator approaching the same object with a different background of thought. Nor is this all. Putting aside all that may be said as to the bias of investigators, it may be urged that the subject of investigation itself is charged throughout with the ideals, emotions, interests of men and women, both as individuals and as corporate bodies. And moreover, the logic of those ideals, the very thing which social philosophy investigates, the degree that is, of their mutual consistency or inconsistency, is a matter of profound importance to the actual working. If two ideals penetrate the same nation or the same class and those two ideals are at bottom in conflict, the results must show themselves in the tangle of history. They must manifest themselves in divided aims and ultimately in failure. If, on the other hand, they are coherent and harmonious, then once more the result must appear in the greatness of the success attending their historical development. Thus, if we start with the most rigid determination to adhere to facts, we shall find that ideals are part of the facts, and if we say that nevertheless we will treat them as facts without examining their truth, we shall find it hard to adhere to that position because their consistency and coherence, which are intimately relevant to their truth, deeply affect their practical efficiency. It may be granted that it is easier to distinguish the philosophical and the scientific treatment of society in principle than to keep them apart in practice. In principle, we call the philosophical inquiry that which deals with the aim of life, with the standard of conduct, with all that ought to be, no matter whether it is or it is not. The scientific method we call that which investigates facts, endeavours to trace cause and effect, aims at the establishment of general truths which hold good whether they are desirable or not. The distinction of principle is clear. But in point of fact, the inquiry into ideals can never desert the world of experience without danger of losing itself in unreality and becoming that which 
the poet of idealism was unfairly called a beautiful ineffectual angel beating in the void his luminous wings in vain. The ideal, though it has never been realised and perhaps may never be realised, must grow out of reality. It must be that which we can become, not that which is utterly removed from the emotions and aspirations which have grown up within us in the actual evolution of the mind. The ethically right, Professor Hoftings has said, must be sociologically possible. Thus, even as pure theory, the philosophical view cannot afford to disregard the facts. Still less can it do so if it passes over, as philosophy should, into the constructive attempt to reorganise life in accordance with its ideals. If the principles which it discovers are to be realised in this workaday world, this can only be by intimate knowledge of the details of this world, by the control of events through their causes, for the discovery of which we must go to pure science. Social science, on the other hand, as we have seen, cannot ignore the element of idealism as a working factor, as one of the forces, if you will, among other forces, which it studies. Nor can it disregard the logical consistency or inconsistency of ideas upon which the working force depends. Thus the philosophical, the scientific and the practical interest, however distinct in theory, tend in their actual operation to be intermingled and it must be admitted that we cannot carry one through without reference to the other. Nevertheless, to keep these issues distinct at every point is the first necessity of sound reasoning upon social affairs. What is essential for social investigation, whether it starts with philosophic or scientific interest, is that in putting any question it should know precisely what that question is, specifically whether it is a question of what is desirable, of what ought to be, or a question of what has been, is, or probably will be. These two questions, though necessarily related, are no less necessarily distinct, and to confuse them is the standing temptation of the social inquirer. If the social philosopher has sometimes thought to legislate for society without first informing himself of the facts as to what is possible and what is not, the scientific sociologist on his side is not innocent of all encroachments. It is a standing temptation to overbear questions of right and wrong by confident predictions which in reality rest more on the prepossessions of the prophet than on his insight into cause and effect. It is the weakness of human nature that it likes to be on the winning side. And just as in an election the argument most effective in catching votes is the demonstration that we are winning already, a demonstration which might seem to make effort on that side superfluous, so in the study of social and economic development it is rhetorically effective to demonstrate that a particular social change is at hand, that it is an inevitable consequence of a concatenation of events that is bringing it about whether we will or not. And this demonstration exercises, and is intended to exercise, a kind of coercion upon our minds whereby we resign ourselves to accept the chains as desirable on the strength of arguments which have never touched its desirability at all, but have proved, if they have proved anything, nothing more than the probable effect of certain operative causes. Intellectually, this method is one of confusion. Morally, it is paralyzing to the will. If there were nothing for us but to accept the trend of events as we find them, then our science would relapse into fatalism, and as members of the society which we study, we should be in the position simply of knowing the course of the stream which carries us along without any increase in the power to guide it, whether it happened to be taking us into the haven or over Niagara. When we allow social science thus to persuade us of the inevitableness of things, we are reversing the normal course of science. For whatever else may be said of science, one of its functions is to increase human power, and this applies to sciences which deal with human life as well as to sciences which deal with inanimate objects. When we know the etiology of a disease, 
we acquire for the first time a real prospect of controlling it. So it should be in social affairs. But so it can only be if we hold firmly to the distinction between the desirable and the actual, if we grasp clearly the principles which should regulate social life, and do not allow ourselves to be shaken in our hold of them by any knowledge of the changes which are actually going on among us. The foundation, therefore, of true social method is to hold the ideal and the actual distinct and use our knowledge of the one as a means to realising the other. We may pursue the two investigations, if we will, side by side, for we have seen how very closely they are interwoven. But every question that we ask and every statement that we make ought to be quite clearly a statement as to fact or an assertion of what ought to be, and never a hybrid of the two. This distinction would, I think, be accepted both by the bulk of ethical thinkers and of scientific students of society, but there exists a form of social theory which repudiates it in principle. The foundation of this theory is the belief that the ideal is realised in the actual world, and in particular in the world of organised society, not in the sense already noted above that there are ideals operating as psychological forces in human beings, but in the sense that the world at large, and in particular the social world, is, if properly understood, an incarnation or expression of the ideal. That, as one thinker would put it, the absolute is perfection, or, as Hegel, who may be considered as the father of this school, laid down, the insight of which philosophy is to lead us is that the real world is as it ought to be. Reference, Philosophy of History, page 38. The theory of society on this view is not to be detached from general metaphysics. It is an integral part of the philosophy of things. Just as in a simple form of religion the powers that are ordained of God, so the metaphysician who starts from the belief that things are what they should be, the fabric of human life, and in particular the state system, is part of an order which is inherently rational and good, an order to which the lives of individuals are altogether subordinate. The problem of social theory upon this view will not consist in the formulation of ideals as distinct from anything actual, yet capable of becoming actual if one human beings grasp them with a firm determination to realise them, still less can it consist in investigating facts in distinction from ideals, for the very foundation of society as a part of the fabric of things is the ideal which it enshrines. The problem will be neither ethical nor scientific. It will start by a repudiation of the distinction upon which we have been insisting and its task will be to state the nature of society in terms revealing the ideal elements which mere facts have a tendency to veil from our human eyes.